Thank you for uh, coming this evening. I think we're, we may be competing with a couple of other programs uh, in Atlanta, and so I very much appreciate you, you being here. Thank you to the staff from the MS Foundation for, for coming to, uh, up, making the trip from, from South Florida. And I'd also like to uh, echo the thank you to Tevin Neuroscience for uh, giving us their generous support and allowing us to be here. One of the goals of these monthly programs was to allow us as, a, as an MS community to talk about whatever we want to talk about, to not have to focus on one drug in a program, to really give an unbiased sort of view of what's out there, whether it's relapse management, symptom management, or what we're shifting into this evening, disease-modifying therapies. So we've been doing this program, I think, since September of 2015, doing a one monthly, and we're just now getting to disease-modifying therapies. And a lot of the, the uh, programs that you see out there will focus on those and those alone. These are very important treatment options, but it's not the whole picture. There's a lot to managing your multiple sclerosis other than just being on a long-term therapy. And what we're gonna start with this evening are the injectable therapies. How many of you remember back when it was just ABC? Those were our treatment options. It was Avonex, Beta, Seron, and Copaxone. Well, now we have 13 FDA-approved treatment options. And before we dive into some of the newer things that are out there, I wanna take you back and talk about some of the injectable therapies. I'm gonna see if my remote will work here. It does. So the goal of these medications is to alter the course of your multiple sclerosis. So everything that we currently do in MS, and I show this slide in almost every talk that I do, because it brings us back and focuses, focuses us on how do we manage MS. Everything we do in MS right now is either treating a relapse, treating symptoms, or changing the course of your multiple sclerosis. So we're gonna shift now to what we do to alter the course of your MS. This is your toolbox. These are the 13 FDA approved treatment options for managing uh, multiple sclerosis and altering the course. We're gonna start tonight with the ones in yellow, the injectable therapies. So what are the goal of these, the, of these medications? Number one, it should be a lifestyle fit for you. You should tolerate it. If I give you a medication that is 100% effective at stopping your MS, but it makes you 100% miserable, I'm gonna take a wild guess that you're not gonna take that medication because you're not gonna be very happy with the drug or with me. So you gotta to tolerate the medicine. We would like to prevent relapses. We would like to prevent dis a disability progression, and we would like to prevent new lesions on MRI. One of the things that's not up here is symptomatic improvement. These drugs are not designed to make people feel better. And I know all of us know that in our heart, but we have to sometimes re-emphasize re that because normally when you take a medication, I don't care if it's a blood pressure medicine or something for your headache or your insulin for diabetes, something gets objectively better. Your pain goes away, your blood pressure goes down, your blood sugar is maintained. These drugs are like an insurance policy for the future. Do sometimes people feel better on these medications? They do sometimes, but that's, that's fortunate. That's icing on the cake. These drugs are really designed to keep you where you're at. So whatever level you're functioning at, when you start one of these medications, our goal is that if we saw you one year, two years, five years, 10 years down the line, is that you look exactly like you did when you started that medication. So what are the injectable treatment options, the shots that we have out there? Well, there's one group called beta interferons, and we'll spend some time talking about what those are. The, the drugs in that class are Avonex, beta seron, Rebif, Extavia, and Plegrity. And then you've got the, the two drugs that are not interferons, that's Copaxone and Glotopa. So what are beta interferons? So beta interferons are cytokines. Cytokines are chemical messengers. If you think about your immune system, think about your immune system like an army. It's an army that's designed to protect you from the environment, from bacteria, from viruses, from you know, all parasites, anything that would attack you. It's also designed to, to protect you from internal threats cancer being the main one. So your immune system is constantly picking off precancerous cells, killing a virus here, killing a bacteria there, 
And some of the way that that immune system coordinates itself is through cytokines, these chemicals that let white blood cells talk to one another. The other, other part of the immune system is sort of like the, the, the police officers, if you will. They're the regulators, the marshals of your immune system. If your immune system is unregulated, you get an autoimmune disease. So multiple sclerosis is a condition where your immune system is a little bit too active and it's picking on something that it shouldn't be picking on. And one of the ways that we can modulate what your immune system is doing is through these chemical messengers or cytokines. And there are thousands of cytokines out there. Beta interferons are one of those. There are other types of interferons out there. There are, type, there are interferons called alpha interferons. Uh, and hopefully my brace is not squeaking too much. If I, if I start moving too much, just, I'll tie my hand behind my back. Um, alpha interferons you may hear of uh, for treatment in certain types of cancer, like melanoma. They're also used for treating active hepatitis uh, uh, over time. It, it was a little scary when beta interferons came out for, for multiple sclerosis back in 1993 because people had never heard of a beta interferon in the MS world, but some people were familiar with alpha interferons. Maybe they had a family member who had melanoma and, it, and were treated with an alpha interferon for melanoma. And what they frequently remembered is that person was really sick on alpha interferons. And the, the difference between alpha interferon treatment for melanoma or hepatitis and beta interferon treatment for multiple sclerosis is the dose. When they treat melanoma with alpha interferons, they use massive doses. So people do get pretty sick with that. Um, and they, but the good news is it's for a short period of time. It's not a lifelong treatment. Gamma interferons, that's another type of interferon out there. Early on in multiple sclerosis research, when interferons were discovered, gamma interferons were tried out as an MS treatment. Years and years ago, when I was doing some work with a group called the Jimmy Hugo Center, that's now called the Can Do Center, there is a psychologist in Seattle who has multiple sclerosis, and he was part of the original gamma interferon trials. In research, that was a trial you did not want to be part of, because we didn't know it at the time, but gamma interferons not only didn't make MS uh, more stable, they may actually made MS worse. Uh, gamma interferons is what your immune system uses to help fight off viruses and things like that, and it's not a good thing in multiple sclerosis. To add injury to insult in the gamma interferon trial, they gave the medicine into your spinal fluid. So you came in once a week and you got a spinal tap and you had gamma interferon put into your spinal fluid and you got really sick and then you had all the potential side effects from having a spinal tap every week. So they stopped that trial pretty early on. So what, where did uh, interferons come from? They were discovered back in 1957 uh, in London by two researchers, Isaacs and, and Lindemann, and they named them interferons because they interfered with viruses. Here's, I found this. So this is a comic strip. How many of you remember Flash Gordon? So Flash Gordon, you know, been around since the 19, probably 20s or so, uh, comic strip. He was the space, space man superhero guy. It's hard to read this, but what, this was a comic strip from 1960, three years after interferons were discovered. And this, this comic strip writer talks about some, peop, some guy being really sick with a virus, and they've already lost some of their crew members. They die, and they ro roll out interferon to treat this guy, and he miraculously comes out of a coma, and he survives because he's treated with interferon. So this was a big deal back in 1957 when these were discovered. We're going to fast forward now to Buffalo, New York. I named Dr. Larry Jacobs. Uh, Dr. Uh, Larry Jacobs is a great uh, MS researcher, uh, ran the, the, uh, the Baird MS Center up in Buffalo, New York. And he tells the story of some, one of his friends who was an oncologist, a guy who's managing cancer, having beta interferon. And this was real human beta interferon, and there wasn't very much of it. But the oncologist, the cancer guy, gives it to Dr. Jacobs and says, why don't you do some research with this? What do you think you could treat with it? Dr. Jacobs thought that you could probably treat multiple sclerosis with it, and he turned out to be right. So what he did is he put this beta interferon, again, into the spinal fluid of, of 10 people with multiple sclerosis, and he showed that they had fewer attacks. One of the problems they had back then is that when they used beta interferon, this was real human beta interferon, isolated from the circumcised foreskins from baby boys, and there just wasn't enough of it to go around. So you didn't have very much to treat people with, but that's where it came from. So 1990 now, we're starting to get into something called recombinant DNA technology. You can take human DNA, take a little piece of DNA that's a roadmap for beta interferon, 
put that roadmap into a cell and you turn that cell into a little beta interferon factory. So now you're not having to go and torture baby boys anymore. Now you can get it from this little cell and you can make beta interferon. The NIH sponsored a trial for, for Dr. Jacobs and they suggested that rather than giving the, the medicine into the spinal fluid, why don't we try to give it into the muscle instead and see if, if it works that way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kinda take you back a little bit now because we're gonna talk about what does interferon do. In a few minutes, we'll get to what, what does copaxone do in your body. And I'm gonna torture you just a little bit with, with immunology. So in your body, again, think of these cells in the immune system. You have cells called T cells. And within those T cells, they have different numbers on them. Some of the numbers that we use are called TH. If you have a TH0 cell, which is the one up on the top, or, or a naive T cell, that's kind of like a, a teenager. It hasn't learned what it wants to be in life yet. And depending upon what it's exposed to, it can go down a couple of different pathways. It can become a Th1 cell. These are cells that make inflammatory cytokines. It makes things like gamma interferon. Or it can become more of an anti-inflammatory T cell, a Th2 cell. In multiple sclerosis, we think you live too much on the Th1 side of the equation. That's one of the problems with multiple sclerosis. If you think of a balance, and normally you have a balance between Th1 and Th2, in multiple sclerosis, you now live over here. You've got too much Th1 inflammatory activity. So let's, let's think now about the blood-brain barrier. So now in multiple sclerosis, you've got a lot of these inflammatory Th1 uh, cells floating around, making things that are gonna damage myelin. Well, the myelin is in the, the central nervous system. Normally, the blood-brain barrier, or BBB, is pretty picky about what it keeps in your blood vessels and what it lets into your brain and spinal cord. In multiple sclerosis, your blood-brain barrier is a little more open than it should be, and it's letting things in that it shouldn't be letting in. One of the things that it's letting in are these Th1 inflammatory cells. Part of the problem is with, with a, an enzyme called MMP, matrix metalloproteinase. That's part of what's opening that door up and letting things in a little more easily in multiple sclerosis. So again, part of the issue with MS, you've got too much inflammation, too many Th1 cells, and the door is too open to the brain and spinal cord. So what do interferons do? Well, after they were sort of discovered and they were shown to work in multiple sclerosis, what people found is that they work up there in those Th1 cells. They sort of keep those cells from making too many of themselves and they decrease the amount of the inflammatory cytokines that those cells cause. Probably more importantly, one of the things that interferons do is they close the door. They work on the blood-brain barrier on that enzyme called MMP or matrix metalloproteinase. They close the door and they're not letting inflammatory cells get in. One of the things that was noticed very early on with interferon research is that if you took someone with MS who had a lot of active inflammation on their brain MRI, a lot of enhancing lesions, and you put them on an interferon and you repeat their MRI about a month later, all of that active inflammation seems to quiet down very quickly, and that's because of what interferons do at the blood-brain barrier. They close the door pretty quickly and pretty effectively. So you've got two different types of beta interferons out there. You've got one class called beta interferon 1b and another one called beta interferon 1a. Beta seron and extavia are beta interferon 1b. So remember we said that originally they got interferons from these poor little baby boys. Now we're putting the, the, the human DNA into a cell. So uh, Berlex Pharmaceuticals, Berlin Exports, German company, decided to take their human DNA and they're gonna make their interferon, beta seron, they put it into E. coli cells. That scares some people when we say that. There's no E. coli in beta seron. That's the little factory that's making beta seron. So they took these bacteria, they put a piece of human DNA in, into it and they said, bacteria, your job now is to make beta seron. And they've got these big vats of, of these bacteria just cranking out beta seron. And that's where the drug comes from. The reason it gets a 1B designation is because these bacteria are not human mammalian cells, the interferon comes out looking just a little bit differently uh, from, the, from real human interferon. And we'll get to that in just a second. 
So what are the side effects of, of beta seron and Extavia? Um, the injection sites themselves, you can have redness, itching, a lump. One, if you're on an interferon that's given subcutaneously, one of the side effects we're always aware of is something called a necrotic injection site. That's a little area where the skin has died just a little bit. If you're on an inter interferon and you get something that looks like a little sore that doesn't he heal, be sure to tell your healthcare provider because underneath that little sore may be a much bigger sore and it's something that we want to get uh, looked at pretty quickly. Um, if you have pre-existing depression, that can get worse with interferons. It, they typically don't cause depression out of the blue. It's usually someone who's already had depression. Same thing with migraine headaches. If you've had migraine headaches, those can sometimes get worse with interferons. We do some blood testing with interferons. We look at your white blood cell counts, your liver function studies, and every now and then we'll probably do a thyroid function. So that was beta seron came out in 1993. I don't know if you, if you remember when it came out, there was this weird lottery system. The, so the, the drug got approval and Berlex at that time, they were just really getting up and running with this human DNA technology. They didn't have enough drug to treat everybody in the United States who needed to be treated. So it was this weird situation where they had a lottery. We've never seen anything like that in medicine where people with MS were given a number. And if you were number one through 10,000, you got put on the drug right away. If you were over 10,000, you got the drug when, it, when production caught up to it. Luckily, it caught up pretty quickly, so people weren't kept uh, waiting very long. So what about Extavia? So Extavia is not generic beta seron. Gen uh, Extavia is beta seron made in the beta seron factory, shipped to Novartis Pharmaceuticals, and relabeled as Extavia. There's this weird licensing agreement that I, I don't think I understand fully, but it's, it is the exact same drug made in the exact same factory. They just ship a, a batch of it over to another pharmaceutical company, and they sell their version of it. So what about beta interferon 1A? This is, is going to be Avonex, Rebif, and Plegrity. So the, again, think about that, that human DNA technology. So Biogen and Serono, the uh, two companies that make these drugs, took their human DNA and they put it into Chinese hamster ovarian cells. Why Chinese hamster ovarian cells? I have no idea, but that's their interferon factory. And so because these are mammalian cells, the interferon that they make ends up looking closer to human interferon. So that's why it gets a 1A versus the 1B. At the end of the day, does it matter 1B versus 1A? Probably not. Uh, the way that, if you look at the dosing on beta seron, for instance, beta seron is 250 micrograms given every other day subcutaneously. The easiest one to compare that to is Rebif. Rebif at its full dose is 44 micrograms subcutaneously Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, about a fourth the dose of, in a microgram basis of beta seron. The reason the beta seron dose is higher is because it doesn't quite look like the human uh, interferon. Some of it's not actually used. It becomes inactive. So to make up for the part that's inactive, they just go up on the dose a little bit. At the end of the day, we don't think that matters. You know, we're, if, when we talk about beta seron, extavia, rebif, we think the end result in terms of how effective they are is really the same across the, those three drugs. So you've got three of these uh, 1A molecules. You've got Avonex, which is 30 micrograms intramuscularly once a week. Plegrity, your next step up, is 125 micrograms subcutaneously only twice a month. So how do they get away with doing that one twice a month, whereas Avonex has to be uh, given once weekly? A few years ago, they came up with something uh, what they called pegylation. And if you pegylate an interferon, you make it stick around a little bit longer. What they were really hoping with Plegrity is that they would get it to a once a month injection. They didn't quite get there, but they, they got it down to twice a month. And then you've got Rebif, which is three times a week. The side effects with these drugs are exactly the same as the side effects with the 1B drug, so no difference between those two. One of the things that we do know, so when you look across all of these interferons, I mean, there, there's slight differences, 1B, 1A, but we don't think that that's important. What does seem to matter, though, is the total dose that you're getting. And as you go across the drugs and you look at the lowest dose versus the highest doses, what you see is that Avonex is the lowest dose of interferon, Plegrity would be next, and then you've got beta seron Extavia and Rebif. For, you know, back in 1993 through about 1998, there used to be just 
wars over this, this issue. And the drug companies and doctors and nurses would really get into big fights over this dosing issue. And what the Academy of Neurology said a few years ago is that it does look like in humans with multiple sclerosis that there is a biological dose response curve. So if I took 2,000 people with MS and I put them on a high dose of interferon, and I took 2,000 people with MS and I put them on a low dose interferon, in general, the people on the higher dose are probably gonna be doing a little bit better but there's a lot of variability. So as an individual, we don't have a way of knowing, well, are you someone that could get away with a little bit of interferon like Avonex, or are you someone that needs a big dose of interferon, or are you in between, a plegrity? We just don't know. And so different MS centers around the country have different thoughts on that. So for instance, here at Shepherd Center, we tend to go with the higher dose of interferon more commonly. Other centers will say, no, I'm gonna try the low dose first, and then if you need a higher dose, I'll go up on it. And I don't think there's a clear cut right or wrong uh, either way, but that's the difference in dosing between those drugs. Shifting gears now to, to tell the Copaxone story a little bit. So to, to think about Copaxone, again, we have to take a step back a little bit and think about who gets multiple sclerosis. Humans have the unique honor of being the only animal that gets multiple sclerosis. There is no other animal out there get, that gets MS that we know of. So in research, if you want to study multiple sclerosis, you have to recreate something that looks like MS. And the animal version that they use is called EAE, Experimental Allergic Encephalomyelitis. And the animal that they picked on was the mouse to create EAE. So what you want to do to give a mouse EAE and create something that looks like MS is you take myelin basic protein, that insulation of the nerve fibers, from a different species, usually a cow. So it's bovine myelin. And you're gonna take that myelin from the cow and you're gonna inject it into the mouse. The mouse's immune system is gonna say, you know what, that's not my myelin, I better react to it, it's something foreign. Unfortunately, in the process of reacting to that cow myelin, the mouse's immune system is gonna start reacting to its own myelin. So you create something that looks like multiple sclerosis. Depending upon the dose of myelin, how frequently you give it, you can make things that look like relapsing remitting MS, secondary progressive MS, primary progressive MS, and to this day, this is still the model that we use. There's some problems with that, that model. There, the mouse's immune system ultimately is not the human immune system. And there are things out there, research drugs that have worked beautifully in mice and haven't worked in humans. There may be things that work in humans that might not work in that mouse, but the way research usually works is you always start with the mouse. What if there's a drug out there that's gonna be a, a perfect fit for humans, but you can't get past the mouse model? That's not a good thing. One of the ways that, that people tried to get around this was uh, through, in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, at the Weizmann Institute. A group of researchers back in 1967 said, well, what if we didn't have to sacrifice the cow to give the cow myelin to the mouse? What if we came up with a synthetic myelin that we create in a test tube, and that's gonna cause this MS-like illness in, in the, the mice? So they came up with some things called copolymers. Copolymers were amino acids put together to look like myelin, but it was totally synthetic, and you were going to cause this MS-like illness in mice. They failed. They gave these mice the copolymers, different ones. There was copolymer one, two, three, four, all the way out through a hundred, and none of them made the mouse sick at all. A few years later, so now fast forward about four years out, someone said, well, let's go back to these mice that we, that we gave this synthetic myelin to. Let's do some other experiments. And what they found is that if you gave the mouse the copolymer, the synthetic myelin, and then you gave them cow myelin, which should make them sick and give them this MS-like illness, they actually blocked the MS-like illness. So they had blocked the very thing they were trying to create just through a lot of serendipity and, and, and probably some divine guidance. So in 1972, they start filing patents for copolymer one. They thought that that was the most effective of the copolymers uh, in, in both Israel and uh, other countries, including the United States. 1987, the results of a double-blind placebo-controlled trial in multiple sclerosis are, are presented in the New England Journal, and Teva Pharmaceuticals picks up the, uh, the patent in Israel. 1996, the drug gets FDA approval. If you had asked us in 1996 how we thought Copaxone worked, we would have said, well, these guys designed it to look like 
like myelin. Therefore, it must be a decoy molecule. It directs the attack towards itself rather than towards your, immune, towards your myelin. So it just serves as a decoy molecule. Turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. And it's complicated in a way that goes back to this balance between Th1 and Th2. Turns out that the copaxone molecule is taken up by something called a macrophage. Macrophages are called big eaters. They're, they go in and chew up myelin. But one of the other jobs of the macrophages is they present things to these immature teenage T cells and they say, hey, why don't you, why don't you react to this? Well, it turns out that when the copaxone molecule is presented to these immature T cells, it sends them down the good pathway, down the Th2 pathway and not the Th1 pathway. So it's taking you from this imbalance back to this. So it's not suppressing your immune system, it's just putting things back in line. So again, this happens out in the, the bloodstream. You get these Th2 cells that are now copaxone autoreactive. So it's a cell that's primed to react to the copaxone molecule. The drug, these, the, these cells actually cross that blood-brain barrier and get into the central nervous system. Once they're there, they start encountering the myelin basic protein, which is what copaxone was designed to look like. Once they do that, these, these cells start cranking out these Th2 cytokines, the good anti-inflammatory chemicals. A few years ago, they discovered that these cells also make something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's a protective substance that protects against inflammation. So kind of go back and think about the interferons, what they're doing. They're helping close the door to the brain. They're helping decrease those Th1 cytokines. You've got now copaxone working in the brain itself uh, and actually uh, downregulating some of the inflammation in the brain. Very different models of how you attack the problem. What if you put them together? Would that be a good thing or would it be a bad thing? There was some early theory that maybe it's a bad thing. Maybe if, you close, if the interferon's closing the door, well maybe then the copaxone cells can't get into the brain where they're supposed to do their thing. Um, so they did early studies and the early studies showed that it was not a bad thing. Unfortunately, it wasn't a good thing either. There was a huge study called Beyond where people with MS were put into one of three groups. They were either put on copaxone, they were put on regular beta seron, the usual, the dose that we use now, or they were put on a double dose of beta seron. At the end of the day, all three groups looked the same. And so what it told us is that, that more wasn't better. They also had a combination group in there, um, I'm sorry, that was actually a separate study, that showed that the combination was not any, any better. Around the same time, there was a study out that looked at, at uh, Rebif versus Copaxone and showed that they were about the same. So when we think about beta seron, Rebif, Copaxone, it does look like they're in the ballpark in terms of effectiveness. One of the things we do know, though, is because they work so differently, I do believe there are people out there who respond better to one class or the other. We're not smart enough to know up front, you know, are you a better copaxone person or are you a better Rebif, beta seron Xtavia, or Avonex person? So there is some trial and error that goes into that. But having a person, let's say, that's not doing well on copaxone move over to Rebif or beta seron is not a bad thought because, again, they do attack the problem through very different angles. So what are the, the uh, glutiramer side effects that we see? Um, injection site redness, so lumps, redness, itching at the injection site. Tends to be a little bit more of a problem when you first start the drug. Lipoatrophy, little divots at your injection sites. Fat cells are actually shrinking when that happens. For whatever reason, this tends to be much more of an issue in women versus men. I, don't, I can't remember the last time I've seen lipoatrophy in a guy on Copaxone for MS. And then a side effect that is unusual, but we want you to know about it because you, if you weren't expecting it, it would scare you, is something called an immediate post-injection reaction. And when I say immediate, it is immediate. You, usually you're doing, literally you're still doing your shot. You'll feel your heart rate go up. You might feel some tightness in the neck or chest. You might feel sweaty. Sometimes there's nausea. It's frightening. If you didn't know better, you would think it was some sort of cardiac or pulmonary event. What's probably happened is you've bumped into a capillary, you got a little bit of the medicine into the bloodstream, and it's gonna go away after a few minutes. There's really nothing you need to do in terms of uh, seeking medical care. We do like to know about that. Most people are gonna have one of these events if, if they ever have any. 
I have had a handful of unfortunate people who've had more than one of these attacks. And what tends to happen then is there's, they get a little gun shy about doing their shots. They're, you know, they, they're starting to do their shots. Going, Man, that feels horrible when I have that. So they start skipping injections. And so that's why we like to know about these, just to, to try to head off, head off any problems before they get started. So these are your glutirimer options out there. You've got the original Copaxone that came out, 20 milligrams subcutaneously daily. And then a couple of years ago, you saw a new form come out, 40 milligrams subcutaneously, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So you're cutting your number of shots in half. You're still getting roughly the same amount of the drug on board. Well, why did they come out with the 40 milligrams subcutaneously? Because their patent was running out on the 20 milligram form. And so they knew there was a good chance that there might be a, a competitor out there, a generic form. And that's what happened with Glotopa. Glotopa is, is what we call a, a biosimilar uh, form. It's a, a drug that was looked at in the laboratory and shown to be molecularly identical to the name brand form. And then through some, chemi through some laboratory tests was shown to, to have the same effect in the immune system in the laboratory. They did not do human trials with Glotopa, but the FDA said, listen, because the drug looks the same molecularly and it has the same effect in the immune system in the test tube, we think that it will do the same thing in humans. So far, that seems to be the case. So you've got really the Copaxone 20 and the Glotopa 20 are very similar molecules. Sometimes the difference in uh, you know, whether a person's on one versus the other comes down to the customer service part of things. You know, which one is gonna give you better copay assistance or does your insurance company prefer you on one versus the other? I can tell you if you look at the average wholesale price of these drugs, what you see is that the 40 milligram Copaxone is the cheapest, next is the gl Glotopa, and next is the Copaxone 20. The problem with just looking at the average wholesale price is that probably doesn't reflect what your insurance insurance companies paying for these drugs and you and I never know that. So your insurance company might get a better deal on one of these versus the other and they may be steering you towards one of these options versus another because it's, it's a better deal for them. So in wrapping up, so we've talked about all the interferons, we've talked about Copaxone, we've talked about uh, Glotopa. Why is there not a pill form of these, these medicines? It's not for lack of trying. Studies of, of oral forms of all of these drugs have failed. The, the pill form of Copaxone worked beautifully in those mice back there. There are a lot of mice out there going around who are now very protected from EAE. Unfortunately, it didn't work in humans. So that's an example of something that worked really well in the mouse model, but not so much in the human model. Part of the problem may be that, that uh, glutirimer is, is four amino acids put together. It's a protein. And so in the human gut, it's probably broken down so that it can't do what it's supposed to do. Beta interferons are definitely large proteins. And to get that large protein through your gut and absorbed into your bloodstream is going to be pretty tough. So the trials of oral interferons just have, have, have not been effective. Do interferons and glutirimer, do those work the same way that the pills do that we have right now. So we've got Jelenia, Abagio, and Tecfidera, completely different animals. And so next month, we're gonna talk about those oral medications and where those might fit into, the, uh, into your toolbox and uh, what, what's good and what's not so good about those medications. All right, thank you guys very much for coming out this evening. Again, we appreciate uh, you being here. I appreciate the support from the MS Foundation and from Teva Neuroscience. And we will see you next month when we're gonna talk about the oral medications for managing multiple sclerosis. Thanks guys.